everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Randy Martinez is a man making a difference in the world. From his work with nonprofits to his role in corporate America, his mission is to help others. Where does this drive come from? Well, 30 years ago, Randy had a life-altering experience, and this is the first time he is sharing his story. Randy, welcome to Bump in the Road. Um, Give us a little bit of background on your story. Sure. Sure. So, um, like I just mentioned, I, I've never, I, I don't, I don't talk about this. It's been uh, over 30 years uh, since I was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, I don't, I don't mention it to people. I don't talk about it. Uh, I don't go into detail. It wasn't until last year that I was asked to do a keynote that I did highlight a little bit, um, you know, or I, knew, I mentioned that I that I had cancer and and talked about, you know, my work at CBS. Um, uh, but I really don't, don't discuss it much after that, you know, outside of that. Um, but it was 30 years, 30 years ago that I, I learned that I had cancer and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm 50 and I remember when I was about nine years old watching a movie and, and I'll, I'll tell you the name of the movie in a second, but it was this one particular scene that really hit me. And, and, and I thought about that, you know, through my teenage years and, and I never understood why I could never stop thinking about this particular scene in this movie from when I was nine. And it was a man and his, uh, and he was in a bathtub in boiling water, um, because the pain from cancer was so bad that his family had him in, they were pouring boiling water into a bathtub. And, um, and I remember that they named an elementary school after him in New Mexico. It's uh, John Baker, uh, who was a, a track star at the University of New Mexico and became uh, uh, you know, this celebrated person, but they, they did this story about his life as a, in his twenties with cancer. And so that scene really stood out the name of the movie, a shining season uh, that chronicled John Baker's life. Um, and so I never really understood why I couldn't get that scene off my mind. And so fast forward um, and I'm 18 years old. And one night uh, I just wake up um, mid in the middle of the night with this excruciating pain um, in my testicle. And I remember getting up to go get my parents and I fell. Uh, I just couldn't, my my right leg went limp and I yelled for them and they came into the room and uh, my, uh, you know, I told them I, I was screaming. And finally, you know, after about, a little while, maybe 30 minutes or so it, it went away and I was able to go back to sleep. My fam, my father was in the air force at the time and we lived in Virginia. And, um, so the next morning, my mother took me to the army hospital, uh, and they said, Hey, you might have an infection or it might be an embroidal testicle, you know, cutting off circulation, uh, take some medication and, you know, come back. Um, you know, if, if things don't change. So we went home and, um, then I, the next day I noticed that the testicle just felt a little harder. Uh, and it started to get progressively harder and larger. And I didn't, I knew there was a problem, but all my friends were home from school and I just wanted to go out and have fun. You know, it was the Christmas holiday and, you know, we, we were all having a, having a great time and, and catching up. And so, um, so about a month went by, uh, and this, this was, I want to say late November of 1988 when I went to the army hospital. And so got through the entire month of December and on January 9th, 
uh, the morning of January 9th, I walk in from being out with a bunch of my friends. It was about two in the morning and my mother is sitting at the top of the stairs and she, I couldn't get to my room without bypassing her. And she said, you're not telling me something. And I looked at her and I said, what, what do you mean? She goes, I just had a dream that you have cancer. And it's probably why I don't talk about this. And um, she said, there's something wrong and you're not telling me. And I said, yeah, there is. And I told her, uh, I told her, you know, mom, the, the testicle has grown a lot and I can't even really sit down. And, um, and she said, all right, we're, we're, I'm taking you to the doctor first thing in the morning. We're going to go to the, um, to the Air Force Hospital, Malcolm Grow Medical Center. And we, um, we drove there and I'll never forget. It was, it was like a, so it's now the morning of January 9th and it was this like a four hour wait in the emergency room. And um, so my mom, who is my mom, I always called her a rat. She's going from doctor to doctor, room to room, you know, finding somebody to, to check, check me immediately. And um, they did. And they had me wait and they called for uh, a urologist out of surgery to come down and take a look at me. And, um, and I remember they were just, you know, they had a, a student doctor there and, and, uh, they went through a series of exams and next thing I know they're running, uh, ultrasounds tests and I'm in surgery by two o'clock that afternoon. Um, oh my God. yeah. And, um, so they removed, they removed the testicle and it was, uh, it was about 95% cancer. Had I waited a few more days, um, it would have started spreading aggressively into my abdominal area, the lymph nodes. Um, one of the weird things about that moment was that my chest um, started to hurt the, you know, the nipple area. And this is something that people don't know. And it's just odd about the human body is that the levels, uh, I, th I believe testosterone were so high that maybe a couple of more days, I would have started discharging from my chest. You know, that's just how intense all this was, was moving, you know, the, the, how fast and, and intense it was. Um, immediately the pain in my chest went away. Uh, but they came in that evening and, and said, uh, you, um, you have cancer. And I didn't know how to take that. I didn't know what to do with that information. Um, it was now the evening of, of, uh, January 9th. And, you know, I'm in this, in this room, my parents, my parents are a mess. They are in the process of starting a divorce, which complicated things even more. Um, and, uh, and I remember that night a man came in and, um, he had your rosary and, um, and I took it and I took the instructions with the rosary, but I didn't do anything with it. I just kept it. Um, and so then, you know, the doctors came in the next day and, and uh, said, you have to um, begin, we have to get you, we have to begin chemo, uh, chemotherapy. And they walked me through what all that meant. And, um, and so they started running a series of exams, you know, eye exams, you know, just across the board. And um, they discovered a retinal hole in my eye. And from years ago, my cousin threw a pen and I know that's what it was. And it lodged in my eye and, and you know, I turned red and whatnot. But they needed to, to fix that because of, you know, me getting sick from chemo, it could break, you know, open that, that retinal hole even more. So they, um, they did laser operation and had to hold off a couple of weeks on chemo, a uh, real simple laser, you know, just a uh, little procedure there. Um, and then they started to see the numbers going down, uh, my tumor markers and the doctors at the, uh, Air Force hospital recommended 
that um, that I hold off and not do chemo, that maybe just wait, you know, for a year and see what happens. And so, um, you know, we went and got a second um, uh, opinion at Georgetown Medical Center. They said the same thing. And so I started to wait. Um, I was supposed to be getting CAT scans during that year. Um, I just didn't. You know, I think there might, for me personally, I mean, I was young. Um, I was kind of avoiding all this. I didn't want to deal with it. Um, and I never heard from the doctors to come in and get a CAT scan. So I just didn't. And so uh, an entire year goes by. And one day I'm, uh, I'm at work. I worked at a hospital, a local hospital in Northern Virginia. And I noticed there was a lump on my upper thigh, my left thigh. And I remember seeing that and my heart just, my gut just dropped. I'm like, this can't be happening again. Uh, I, I can't do this a second time. And um, so I called my boss and I said, I've got to leave. I drove myself to Malcolm Grow Medical Center again. And I went to the ER, it was a, a Sunday and explained everything to them. And they made an emergency appointment with the new urologist the next day. I went in, um, he couldn't believe that I hadn't had a CAT scan all year. Uh, he calls the oncologist and they get into a huge argument from what I understood. Uh, and so I, they do an emergency CAT scan the next day. And sure enough, they find another tumor in my abdominal area. Um, it had spread at this point. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it was, uh, I'll never forget, it was a centimeter and a half tumor. Um, near my aorta. And, um, and so I, uh, we started the process of doing biopsies and I had to do probably one of the most painful things I've ever done in my life where they had to th put a very large, long needle through my intestines to try to get a biopsy out of a, you know, centimeter and a half, uh, tumor. Um, and, uh, they failed both times. It was excruciatingly painful. It was beyond painful. And, um, so from there, we just decided that I would go into surgery. And, uh, so I had, uh, a lymph node dissection, what's called a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Never forget. I had to learn how to say that. Um, and, uh, they removed, uh, about 11 lymph nodes. It was a nine hour operation. Uh, it wasn't until years later that I read the surgery report, which was, you know, like, oh man, that was, that was a tough operation. Um, and then I started chemo after that. Uh, and, and chemo was brutal. Like that was, you know, that was, that was tough. Um, and, um, and so I remember one of the, the medications, cisplatin, uh, they said, look, you know, you're going to start tasting metal in, in your mouth. And, and so um, I remember one day at dinner and we were around the table and I'm like, I couldn't taste my food because it, everything tasted like metal. And, um, and it, was, it was interesting because when I started the first round of chemo, I tanned, my skin got a little darker. I looked healthy. I looked very healthy. And I thought, wow, this isn't that bad. This looks great. And, um, and, we're all around the table one day and I put my head down to put the uh, fork full of food in my mouth and a lump of hair falls on, on the, uh, on my plate. And I just remember my mom, just, she put her hand over her mouth and she was just, she was just shocked. And I think we were all shocked. And I just, I got up and I went upstairs, uh, alone and just started pulling as much hair off my head as I could. And it just, I couldn't believe how it was just coming off so easy. And it, and suddenly it just, I didn't look healthy. I looked bad, you know, it was just, it was horrible. And, um, the next day my cousin took me to the air force barber and, uh, it was packed and they saw me walk in and I took my hat off and, um, they just let me you know, instead of waiting in line, they just said, come on, let's take care of you first. And uh, so um, 
so yeah, so that was that was that experience, and I spent the next several months going through uh, chemo, and that's when I started to pray the rosary. Uh, I started, you know, I remember sitting in bed after you know all day doses of chemo, and uh, not able to move at all, and just enough to move my fingers across the rosary, just begging to just get out of that situation. Uh, because the feeling of intense chemo is horrible. You're just, you you're, you feel the nausea um, and you feel so hopeless. Uh, and, um, and so I, I would pray the rosary as a, as a, as a way for comfort. Um, and uh, yeah. And so that's, you know, I got through that. I think what, what got me through those moments um I've always been an optimistic person and I, even though I had to drop out of school for a little bit, you know, I saw myself doing something good in the world and, you know, through all that, I just, I just saw something uh, positive. And, you know, my parents were going through a really nasty divorce. Um, this situation was happening. Uh, and I remember there was a gentleman in next to me. He was older, uh, retired from the military, probably in his 70s. And he was undergoing chemo and radiation for a, for a cancer that he had in his neck and his throat. And talking to him and he had given up. And I remember the last conversation I ever had with him, he just, just, he was very negative. And, and, and I remember saying back to him, you know, we're going to get through this. This is going to be fine. It's, it's, it's tough, but we're going to get through it. Um, and I always thought that way. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, my parents got divorced and I started my life. I finally graduated college. Um, it wasn't easy. You know, I, I abused alcohol. I turned to drugs early on. Uh, I felt insecure. I didn't know where my life was going, what I wanted to do. I just, I knew I was going to do something. I just didn't know what. And, um, and so I just started, uh, this path forward kind of aimlessly. Uh, and, and then from there on out, uh, my life took, I, I came across and did some incredible things, uh, and met incredible people, uh, through this really interesting pivoting journey. Um, and, uh, and, and here I am today. You know, what is it <clears throat> that some of us can dig deep and really pivot out of this experience. And then the gentleman you were talking about in the hospital just didn't. Is it, is it, up, is it pure optimism or is there something more there? Uh, you know, I, like I, you know, I mentioned, you know, he was probably in his 70s, 60s or 70s, uh, retired from the military. You know, he, he had a, Probably, you know, I, I don't know what his life was like, but he had a, you know, he had lived a, lot, a good life. Um, I was 19. I was 18. I, I was on the other side of the spectrum. You know, I was looking forward. He was looking back. And, and so for me, I wanted, there were things I wanted to do that I, I, I believed I needed to do. And so um, I think he had already felt that he had done those things. Right. So it's where we were in our lives um, that, that made for a very interesting series of conversations as we both laid there battling cancer together. You know, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that, and you had a very interesting observation and that is that many people who've been through cancer develop a stronger sense of intuition about things. Where do you think that comes from? I, I think it comes, so, you know, it's, it's not just battling cancer. It's, it's people who face death. Uh, 
you're when you the second time the second time I got sick the, or the, when I found out the second time I was very scared at first I thought I'm not I'm not going to make it this is this is serious now you know because again I had a year to understand cancer on un, to read about it uh the different types of cancer how it impacts people um you know people's lives and family members and so uh you know, learning put more fear into me than anything. Um, and then here I find myself uh, going, you know, battling this uh, a second time. And, and so it forces you when you're facing that, it forces you to dig deep into yourself, into your soul to figure out how am I going to battle this? Like, how am I going to fight this? Right. You get in a situation uh, where somebody is uh, threatening your life, um, you're quickly trying to figure out: Can I run fast? Can I dodge the, you know, what the bullet, knife, whatever it may be, the punch? Uh, you know, what are the? And so you have to do that with yourself, and and you have a lot of time to think about everything you are, everything you do, the way you react to things why you react to things. You just do this deep, deep dive into your soul. And, um, and you have a lot of time to do that. And so you develop this intuition and then you see people act a certain way and you think about yourself when you were in that moment. Right. And so it just, it, it elevates a certain level of understanding about the human condition when you're faced with death that most people just take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, I've come across a lot of people that will say, oh, I'm intuitive and I'll ask them what that means. And I'll find out the more I talk to them that they've had death at their doorstep in one way or another. It greatly, <clears throat> excuse me, increases your empathy because you realize everybody is fighting something. That's right. That's right. It's that's exactly right. Uh, it does increase your empathy, you know, which which is what led me to do what I do today. Uh, you know, I graduated college and I started doing uh, nonprofit work. I went out into the world saying, I'm, I'm going to change the world. I want to help other people. I want to, you know, I marched in front of the White House <coughs> for increased representation of Latinos in Congress at the time. You know, I was marching. I rioted. I wanted to make a difference. I started working for a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, and so that's how my, my career started. And, you know, I ended up, I'm in corporate America today. And, you know, I work for, for a big, big company. Um, but the work I do inside that company is to help other people succeed and be the best they can. Uh, and, and so I get to do that uh, to help other people. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've always stayed true to that from the, from the beginning, you know, whether it was from a nonprofit perspective or from a for-profit perspective. Uh, and so I've been lucky in that, in that way. If you could rewrite your story, would you? No. Nope. I, uh, I don't talk. This is the first time I've ever talked about this the way I am. Uh, and that's a great question. And my answer to you is absolutely not. It, it comforts me to know that I, I can, that I went through that, that I went through that, that I went through life and have not just, you know, school knowledge, but a deep sense of understanding of human knowledge, what humanness is. And I love that. I love to, to know that, that I can take a step back and understand humanness and, uh, I don't take that for granted. 
And so I wouldn't rewrite any of it. I've had, let me tell you, Pat, I've had, life has not been easy. Where I am, how I am, how I got to where I am today and how I'm still here is just amazing to me because I've had multiple bumps in the road throughout my life. I've, I have challenges that, that still, that stem from, you know, those, those times, you know, that from that, that experience. Uh, I mean, 30 years, I've never really talked about this until today. And, uh, and I think this is going to do something for me later today and tomorrow and moving forward, having discussed this. Uh, and so um, I would never, I wouldn't change it. If you could give some advice to somebody facing a bump in the road, two or three or four things, what would you, how would you advise them? Oh, geez. I mean, uh, one, you know, find, find, find that thing in you that makes you excited about being you and what you're going to do tomorrow. You know, find that, you know, be optimistic. Know that that tomorrow is just going to be so much more different than today and so much better. Uh, stay true to yourself. Stay true to your to who you are. Um, you know, I, I mentioned to you here a few minutes ago that I'm doing what I set out to do, which was to help people. I, I never imagined it would be where I am and doing it the way I'm doing it today. But it's it's. It's what where I started, and um, and so I'm I'm true to that to what I set out to do, you know, thirty something years ago, um, and just appreciate life, you know. Just we are we are in a tough tough place right now, uh, but we will get through this, and just appreciate the fact that we get to take a, a deep breath every day and appreciate every breath you, t- you take because um, there are a lot of people who don't get that. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.